a small town police officer is called to investigate a strange occurrence out in the middle of nowhere. Along with his colleagues, they find a mysterious hidden tunnel, which in itself poses more questions than it answers. Oh, my dear friends, another little treat for you on this beautiful Monday evening. Yet another story from Mr. Outlaw, and this one is intriguing, mysterious, and downright weird. Special shout out to all of you doing the night shift, as ever. I hope this brings you a bit of relief in your hours of boredom. So, are you ready? Time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, if you can have one. And listen. Well, I suppose found isn't exactly the right word. It's a bit complicated. You'll see what I mean. I'm a cop based in eastern Nevada. Been one for about 12 years. Experienced a lot of things during that period that I could have gone lifetimes without. But, well, everything that I've seen up to this point, as sick and twisted as they might have been, at least they've made some kind of sense or yielded some kind of logical conclusion. But this... I just don't know. The call came through late at night. A panic-sounding man was breathing heavily into the phone, saying something along the lines of, We need help. It's out. They let it out. It was hard to say for sure. He was barely coherent. After a few minutes... The line goes dead. We trace the call to a small shack in the middle of a forest on the other side of town. We found a cell phone that looked like it had been smashed, lying in the grass a few feet away from the entrance. And no man. We go into the shack and search around, but find nothing but a small stool. We scope the place inside out, but there seemed to be nothing. Eventually one of my partners... 240 pound beefcake named Jeff plopped down onto the stool in frustration. As soon as he did this, the entire floor under it gave way. He didn't fall too far, thankfully. Only about four meters. But he'd uncovered something truly bizarre. It was a man-made tunnel. Undergoing the standard protocol and taking extreme precautions, we jumped down. Here was the disconcerting part. The tunnel went both ways. In other words, this was not the starting point. We decided to send four guys one way and three the other. I was part of the three that went backwards from where we'd initially broken through. From the illumination of the flashlights, the tunnel seemed to be pretty barren. Rough, muddy walls and ceilings, along with wooden supports about every half meter. And got me thinking, who the hell would go through the process of making this place? Eventually, we came across what appears to be a ladder descending further downwards. I could sense the hesitation in the air. This was not what we'd expected. We all stood there for a second, not wanting to admit to each other that we really didn't want to go down there. But then, we heard the scream ear-piercing. It wasn't faint, nor was it distant. It sounded like it was coming from only a few meters below us. Fueled by a sudden adrenaline rush, I decided to go down first. The climb was short, only taking me about 15 seconds. I found myself in what I can only describe as a small computer lab. Dirty concrete floors and walls, but there were four monitors all displaying an error screen, all hooked up to what I thought was some kind of power source. But, well, I can't say for sure. I never was a computer guy. Actually, not all of them had the error screen. One out of the four had his screen smashed to bits. Suddenly, we heard another scream. We turned our attention to a half-open door in the far corner of the room. For a brief moment, I saw a dark, shadowy figure move past. The screaming stopped as abruptly as it started, 
being replaced by the sounds of something dragging on the floor. We barged into the room, guns drawn. But, well, it was about half the size of a closet, and there was nothing there. Well, not nothing. There was another tunnel, smaller and a lot cruder than the one we first entered. It led straight vertically down. We shone our flashlights through it, but were met with only black. Safe to say, we didn't pursue whatever had presumably just gone down there. We were all beyond petrified. And I could hear hearts beating and rapid, scattered breaths as we sprinted back out and up into the shack again. When we did, we were alone. We waited in stunned horror for the other officers to come back out. But they never did. I know that cops are supposed to be the bravest of the brave, but well, at that moment, we simply couldn't move. Eventually, we just called it in. Backup arrived, and we told them what had happened. Their collective faces morphed into one of abject confusion. But I could tell that they were horrified just listening to our accounts. I decided to take a break from work. They allowed it. In fact, they never even followed up and told me what had happened. At the time, I just thought that was a good thing, but I could never sleep. It's not even that I was having nightmares. I was just too terrified to let my brain rest. Even with my wife lying at my side, I still felt a vague, perpetual sensation of danger. I needed some kind of closure. I decided to go into the station and ask around myself. I knocked on the captain's door and he let me in. The first thing that I saw when I entered was his expression. I'd never seen him look so terrified before. You want to know what happened, don't you? I nod. He lets out a dry, humorless laugh. <sighs> well, I don't know, was his response. He stopped speaking after that, instead simply staring at me in silence for about minutes before I finally decided to leave. I was too shaken by this to discuss the issue with anybody else. That encounter certainly didn't help my case. I went back home and sat on my couch, going through marathons upon marathons of every comedy movie I could find on Netflix. This helped, but only a little. And then I got a text from Jeff. Come see this right now. I could only assume it had to do with that room. I thought about it for a few hours before finally making my way over to his apartment. Yes, I needed some kind of closure. I needed to take any chance of finding it. As soon as he invited me in, I noticed that he had the same look of indistinct dread that the captain had had. But he was a little more willing to talk. After a quick and somewhat reserved hello, he gestured to a laptop sitting on a table behind him. What the hell is that? I asked him. He lets out a long exhale before answering. Recovered from that room in the tunnel. I thought back to the time that we were down there. I did remember seeing a laptop on one of the tables. I guess this was it. How do you have it? Was my follow-up question. This time, his response was simple. I just took it. Why? He looks away for a second. His demeanor turning contemplative. But something's got to make sense here. Something that they're not telling us. Silently, I agree. I asked him what he found on it. Five video files, he says. All five to ten minutes long. Have you watched them yet? Only one. Things making more sense? He shakes his head before sighing. No, but I think you should see it anyway. 
He leaves the room to grab me a cup of coffee before sitting back down at the table. I open up the video folder and see the names of the five clips. Train to Oblivion. Investigation. Fireworks. Triangle. And the Obscure Man. Watch Train to Oblivion, Jeff says. I take a few moments to think about it before ultimately obliging. This is better than nothing, I thought to myself. I press play. This is what I saw. It starts out with what I assume is handheld footage. As expected, we were on a train. However, there was something immediately wrong. The person behind the camera, it sounded like a woman, was near hyperventilating. She was running down a narrow aisle, while lights flickered above her. In addition to that, it looked as if they were in a tunnel, with the windows only showing darkness. As she ran, she kept opening the cabin doors and peering inside. Every one of them had people. Lifeless people, with the limp faces contorted into inhuman expressions. Mouths stretched way out too far. Eyes sunken inwards, and noses turned completely sideways. At some point, she tries opening a door, but it seems to be locked. We hear hushed whispering coming from behind it, as she starts banging on it, begging to be let in. This is interrupted by heavy footsteps coming from somewhere to her side. She quickly turns her head, facing what looks like three extremely tall figures about 50 meters away. She shrieks and starts running again. The video goes on like this for a while, her just sprinting around the tight space and screaming, while we see intermittent glimpses of the figures following her. However, it wasn't until the end where we got a good look at them. She finds a bathroom and runs into it, locking it from the inside. She sits there, whimpering for a while before the door starts rattling. Her screams become deafening as it finally breaks down. I nearly scream myself when I see what did it. Tall, pale things wearing what looked like dirty suits. But it was their faces that really got me. I don't even think I can call them faces in all honesty. They were just swirls of skin if that makes any sense. Like a pale vortex of flesh. One of them reaches out a bony hand and grabs the woman's wrist. A brief struggle ensues that ends with us facing the mirror. The woman's face was now twisted into the same horrendous expressions that we'd seen on countless other passengers just before. We hear a loud horn blare before the video finally ends. But, well, Here's the weird part. Not that all of this hasn't been weird so far. This just added another level of horror onto what we'd already experienced. In the mirror's reflection, there was no indication that the woman was holding anything to film with. No camera. No phone. Nothing. In fact, her hands were down to her sides. And the creatures sure as hell weren't filming. I remained in downright silence for what felt like an hour after watching this. Jeff said nothing, just stared at me. I didn't know what to make of this. Eventually, I decided to get up and leave. Jeff didn't protest. I'm back home now. There's no clear solution here. It's obvious that my sleeping woes aren't going to end. Not until I figure something out. But that seems like a daunting task. And one that I don't think I'm prepared to handle right now. I think that the best course of action may be to go back and watch the rest of the videos. Surely there's some clue as to what happened within them. However, one thing is pushing me away from that decision. As I was getting ready to leave Jeff's, I saw something out of his kitchen window. 
there was a figure standing behind a street sign. Actually, it was barely a figure at all. It looked more like some kind of shadow. I think it was looking right at me. You know what? It's Monday, and that was a short one, so why not have another story? <laughs> yes, glad you stuck around, because I've got another story lined up for you. You ready for some more? Good. Here we go. It all started in a small, dingy bar on the outskirts of town. Friday night to be exact. I wasn't there to get wasted or anything. I was just trying to relax a bit after work. I remember the place being relatively empty. A few college kids and old timers, but nobody really worth noting. Well, at first that is. I've attempted to think back and try to pinpoint anything that felt off when I first entered. But I couldn't think of anything specific. But something was wrong in that place. I knew it. I know it. Anyhow, about an hour after I'd sat down, this couple walked in. They were a young, good-looking pair. The guy was tall and built, while the woman was striking, wearing what looked like an expensive red skirt. They sat down about four seats away from me, and the guy ordered two gin and tonics. I glanced at them for a few moments, but ultimately went back to sipping my own beer. I thought it'd be well, weird to stare. But now that I'm thinking about it, this is where things began to get peculiar. About five minutes after the couple came in, everybody else in the bar cleared out. Even the bartender seemed to disappear after bringing them their drinks. I remember calling out to him, in an attempt to order another drink. But the guy never came back. I just looked over at the couple and made a what's his deal kind of gesture. The guy didn't pay me any attention, but the woman simply shrugged and smiled. It was right after that where things went fully bizarre. Seeing that the bartender wasn't around, I decided to get up and head to the washroom. While I was finishing up in there, I started hearing something coming from the bar area. It sounded like an argument. A male and female voice locked in a shouting match. Ooh, they're fighting, I thought to myself. I suppose that this wouldn't have been weird on the surface. Some people are just volatile. However, the scene that was awaiting me outside was far from what I was predicting to see. As I pushed through the bathroom door, I could see the couple really getting in each other's faces. The woman seemed to be the most aggressive, though. The bartender also was still missing. I was about to intervene when the woman pulled out a fucking pistol. The man put his hands up and stumbled backwards. Before I could even say anything, the woman took two shots, both hitting the man square in the chest. I was put into a state of incredulous shock. I started inching backwards myself towards the exit. The woman eventually turned her head to look directly at me. As we locked eyes, I froze. I didn't know what to expect, you know? But she just laughed. It wasn't maniacal or demonic or anything like that. It was completely normal. In a different context, it could almost be perceived as friendly. She threw her gun down and spoke to me. Sorry you had to see that, sweetie. And then she started walking towards me. The expression on her face wasn't even malicious or indicated any kind of psychotic motivation. She just seemed normal, which was probably the scariest part. 
Please, don't be scared. That had to happen. I won't hurt you. She stopped about five feet away from me and smiled again. My name's Angie, by the way. Angie Prescott. She then stuck her hand out, presumably for me to shake it. I didn't take that offer. I turned and bolted out of the place. And oh, now that I'm thinking about it, I remember seeing that the sign on the front door read closed when I was running out. It was definitely still supposed to be open at that point, though. Hmm. Weird, I guess. I made it to a more crowded street before pulling out my phone and dialing 911. I suppose that the bartender would have already done it at that point, but I decided to go for it anyways. I told the voice on the other line what had happened, as well as the address of the bar, and they said that they'd send somebody over there to check it out. I was still a bit shaken up by this whole thing, so I decided to call a taxi and head home. About an hour after I'd arrived at my own apartment, I received another call. It was the local police, telling me that I had to come down to the station in order to help clear a few things up. When I got there, they sat me down and began the questioning. What they ended up telling me made no fucking sense. Apparently, there was no body. Well, that would have been understandable, though. The woman must have hid it. But there was also no blood. That was harder to believe. I mean, I clearly saw some splatter on the ground when she took her shots. In fact, the only reason that they didn't write it off as some sort of prank was the fact that there was nobody inside the bar. No patrons, no bartender... No janitor. Nothing. It almost looked as if they'd inexplicably closed the place early. But uh, all the lights and televisions were still on. This would have been weird enough, but there was still an opportunity to explain it away here. It could have been some kind of illicit gang activity. The man who'd been murdered must have been in deep water with some shady people. The bar itself must have been some kind of gang-owned business. That would have been the simple explanation. But, well, that isn't the case here. No, it gets a lot weirder. Apparently, the bartender who was supposed to be working that night was called and questioned in regards to where he was. His response was that his boss had called earlier, saying that his hours had been cut that day and to leave early. So, that's what he did. They then called his boss, but he claimed that he'd never even contacted the bartender that day. Two conflicting stories with no resolution in sight. Even weirder was when they tried to view the security footage for that night. They watched for about 20 minutes before realizing that what they were seeing was just a five minute loop of footage from an earlier week. Well, safe to say, nothing was making sense here. Since they had no idea who this woman was or what she even looked like, they had nothing to go on. But I knew something that they didn't. The sudden realization washed over me just before they were about to ask me to leave for the night. <laughs> she told me her name. Angie Prescott, I told the cops. Yeah, her name was Angie Prescott. I can't tell you why she would tell me that, though. It might be fake, but that's all I have here. The cops searched her up, and to my surprise, they actually found her. But why would she tell me her real name? They pulled up a picture of her driver's license, and I recognized her instantly. It was a hard face to forget, after all. Soon after, they sent me home, telling me that they'd sort everything out, and thanked me for the help. I thought that my involvement in this case would have been finished at that point. That was, until I got a call at 5am. It was the police station again. Apparently, when they went over to her place and started the interrogation, she was adamant in claiming that she'd never even gone out that night. In fact, her boyfriend was still with her. They wanted me to come down again 
in order to identify if it was the same man that I'd seen. To my utter dismay, it was. The feeling that I had was inexplicable at the time. I was staring into the eyes of a man that I'd seen murdered just hours ago. He seemed equally confused by all of this, staring back at me with an expression that I can only describe as a synthesis of disconcertion and disgust. I tried babbling out some kind of explanation, but the cops simply stared at me like I belonged in the psych ward. I could tell that they knew something was wrong here. They definitely realized that the circumstances at the bar were simply too bizarre to write me off as crazy. After a few hours of internal discussion, they just let everybody go. They didn't even give me the whole boy who cried wolf speech. As I was walking out of the station with the couple, I was expecting something from them, whether it be a sinister grin or a threatening wink. But I only got confused stares. Oh, I must be losing my shit, was what I was thinking to myself when I got home. I've been working too much. I need a break. I need a fucking vacation. I was already booking a trip to Hawaii when I heard a knock at my door. Ever so cautiously, I got up and looked through my peephole. It was some dude who looked to be in his late twenties. He seemed fidgety, always looking to his sides and whatnot. He even glanced at the ceiling at one point. Obviously, I was keeping the door closed. After all that, I wasn't in the mood for this kind of shit. I turned my back to the door and started towards my computer again, before he called out to me from the hallway. His voice was shaky and urgent, but it was his words that made me turn around. <sighs> Come on, man, open up. Look, I saw it too. You're not crazy. I just want to talk. I stayed still. The prospect of finding out more was equally intriguing as it was terrifying. But I suppose that the terrifying aspect was just a little bit stronger because I never opened the door. Oh, fuck. I heard him curse through the door. Look, I'm going to write my number down and slide it under the door. Please call me, dude. This shit is messed up. I saw a little slip of paper get pushed through the crack before hearing him walk away. I'm looking at the number right now, still trying to decide what the hell my next step should be. It's a hard one, trust me. Update. Oh, I think I might have to call him. Last night at around 2am, I was having a smoke out on my balcony. I was surveying the emptiness outside before spotting a singular person standing still under a light post on the street opposite to me. They were too far away to make out immediate details, but I managed to do so after a few seconds of squinting. The person was wearing a red skirt. A red skirt. I instinctively stumbled back into my living room upon realizing this. I have the guy's number dialed right now. I don't know whether to call him or the police. Was this even worth calling the police over? Would they even listen to me? Maybe not. But I'm too fucking scared to look out the window again. I think I have to call him. So, a strange little story, that one. Do you think it will continue? I do so dearly hope it will. Many, many more questions asked than were answered in that one. So I am hoping it's going to continue definitely. Well, I will be back again on Wednesday, and I hope you're going to join me again. You will, won't you? Go on, say yes. There you go. <laughs> okay, see you all again real soon. But for now, bye-bye.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay?